Good afternoon and welcome to our virtual event, Doom, a conversation with Neil Ferguson on the politics of catastrophe. I'm Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal, and joining me today to discuss his latest book is indeed Neil Ferguson. He's the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and an acclaimed historian who's written books on everything from finance and social networks to Henry Kissinger and the British Empire. Last year was an unprecedented time, or so it seemed. As COVID-19 spread across the world, public officials cited the unique threat of the virus to justify extreme interventions in daily life. And then civil unrest and violence exploded in US cities in a kind of political or social contagion that accompanied the public health emergency. It was certainly a troubling year. As Neil's book shows, however, disasters and crises are never entirely unprecedented. Political and natural catastrophes are often entwined, and we should try to understand the causes and characteristics of past calamities to help us grasp today's and perhaps better prepare for future disasters. In his new book called Doom, he investigates the common features of geological and atmospheric, political and geopolitical, biological, and technological disasters with that goal in mind. Throughout our conversation, please feel free to submit your questions on whatever platform you're watching us on, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. So Neil, thanks very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to join you, Brian. Um, you analyze in Doom dozens of historical disasters. These range from the Black Death during the 14th century and the Napoleonic Wars of the 19th century to the Titanic sinking in 1911 and the Great Famine in Mao's China during the 20th century. These events happened across many different times and places. But what are the common features in your view, the recurring patterns, and where does COVID-19, uh, the crisis surrounding that, rank among the disasters you discussed? Yes, it might seem a rather eclectic uh, array of, of unfortunate events. And you might wonder what business I have bringing wars and, and pandemics together with earthquakes and, and, and wildfires. But there, there are a couple of things that I think all disasters have in common, certainly the kinds of disaster that I'm interested in. The obvious one is excess mortality, a sudden increase in uh, uh, mortality above what might have been expected based on uh, relatively recent experience, uh, a sudden increase in the probability of, of, of premature death. And, and that, that, that's the same whether you're con confronted by a war or a, a pandemic. And, and I make the argument, which is really borrowed from Amartya Sen's argument about famines, that the distinction between a natural and a man-made catastrophe is a false dichotomy. In many ways, COVID-19 illustrates that really well, even if you don't believe the lab leak hypothesis, though that's looking more and more uh, likely as an explanation of the origins of the pandemic. So that's that's the first idea, that we really can and should think about pandemics and wars uh, in the same within the same framework. The second point that, that hit me when I was reading a book about the outbreak of World War I uh, Céline's, uh, Fernand Céline's extraordinary account at the beginning of uh, Voyage au bout, au bout de la Nuit, it's the fact that to the individual caught up in a disaster, there is a, a, a strange sense of unreality. And the unreality comes partly from the sense that it can't possibly be happening to you. Uh, it, might possibly be happening to somebody else, but it can't really kill you. And that, that's a really important and curious human quirk. We struggle a bit to grasp the idea of a suddenly increased probability of mortality that applies to us. And the other thing I think is quite important, that's the sense of confusion, that one, one is struggling to make sense of this unfolding disaster because it is very unfamiliar. It's a new kind of experience. Not many of us get to experience multiple disasters. Sometimes uh, it happens. I think my grandfather went through a whole succession of disasters beginning with the, the First World War, but most of us get one big disaster, maybe two. When it happens, you're really thrown, uh, no matter how 
well educated you think you are. So those are important common factors, and they explain a lot about our difficulty in dealing with disaster, even when we've attained much higher levels of scientific education than, say, medieval peasants. Uh, you discuss uh, three different types of disasters in the book, black swans, gray rhinos, and dragon kings. Uh, what are these and what distinguishes them? And could you just give a, a few brief examples of each? Well, it sounds like a rather strange zoo, doesn't it? Uh, the, the idea here, these are other people's ideas that I've, I've brought under uh, one zoological roof, is that disasters can appear a little bit like the, the grey rhino that you see trundling towards you uh, across the Serengeti. Uh, you you kind of know it's coming for you and you have some warning because you see it from some distance. And and this is an idea uh, that uh, that characterizes a lot of disasters, that we, we, we see them coming. It's not as if a pandemic was wholly unpredictable. People have been predicting a major pandemic for decades. And in fact, I list all the different TED Talks and op-eds and books that made the prediction that there would be a major pandemic. And it, it's, it's dozens of them. Uh, so that's the grey rhino. The odd thing is that when a grey rhino actually hits you, when the predicted disaster happens, a strange metamorphosis occurs and it's sort of suddenly a black swan and everybody's calling it unprecedented. Uh, this is a year like no other. I heard that many times at the end of 2020. Uh, and and we, we act surprised as if nobody could possibly have foreseen this. Uh, the black swan is a, an idea Nassim Taleb pioneered in a book of that name some years ago. It's, it's the thing that you really can't foresee because it lies outside your your range of experience and also your your kind of distribution of probabilities. Uh, so that's an oddity that that something that we talked about for years when it actually happened uh, in early 2020 took most people completely by surprise as if we hadn't had all those grey rhino TED talks telling us it was coming. Uh, the final idea is the Dragon King. Some disasters kill a lot of people but don't have very major consequences. A good example of this is the 1957-58 influenza pandemic, which almost nobody remembers, including people who were around at the time, killed a proportion of the world's population not that different from COVID. Uh, but its consequences you'd struggle to find in any history book. It's a sort of non-event. Other events kill a lot of people and have huge consequences. And that's where this notion of a dragon king, which I borrowed from Didier Sornet, comes in. It's the idea of an event that's sort of so huge that it lies beyond even a, a power law distribution. And I think the First World War is a good example of this, because the First World War is significant not just because of the 10 million plus people who died in, in conventional warfare. It's significant because of all the consequences that followed from it, like the Russian Revolution and the breakup of the three empires of, of Central and Eastern Europe. So those are the three creatures that I use to try to organize um, a, a typology of disaster. Uh, the idea being that, that excess mortality alone doesn't really uh, determine the historical significance of an event. Uh, people naturally attribute disasters, both human caused and natural or geological or um, whatever, to poor leadership. They, they blame the leaders in charge. But in one of your chapters, you, you write quite interestingly that the point of failure during a catastrophe is often not at the top, but in the middle in a combination of errors you know, committed by technical operators or middle managers. Um, what, what are some historical examples of this? And, and in your view, was that the case in our response to COVID-19 as well? Well, this idea came from reading Richard Feynman's account of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in 1986. Uh, Feynman was a brilliant Caltech physicist who got brought in to the official inquiry and slightly disrupted it with his unorth unorthodox, very non-Washington modes of inquiry. The, the, the key point about uh, the Space Shuttle disaster was um, that the point of failure was in the middle of the NASA bureaucracy. Now, the press corps, when the disaster happened, did what it always does. It tried to pin responsibility on the president. And so there was a story that briefly did the rounds that 
the space shuttle launch had been hurried. It had been uh, moved ahead uh, too fast because Reagan wanted to mention it in his State of the Union. This was a total non-story. It fell apart uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but what had gone wrong? That was less obvious. Now, it's true that make it clear, this wasn't a huge disaster in terms of loss of life. Only seven people died, the crew of the Challenger. But it was a very big disaster in terms of its impact on public consciousness. And I don't know, you may remember watching it on television. Many people watched the launch live and were sort of stunned to see the thing blow up seconds after launch. Anyway, Feynman delved into the, the innards of NASA. And he found to his surprise that the engineers at NASA had known all along that there was a one in a hundred chance the thing would blow up. I mean, this was this was clear to the engineers. So it was clearly only a matter of time until something like this happened because they were doing regular space shuttle launches at that point. But somewhere in the middle of the NASA bureaucracy, a mysterious figure, Mr. Kingsbury, had decided that it would be better to report that as one in a hundred thousand rather than one in a hundred. And, and Feynman's argument is that ultimately it was the NASA bureaucracy's refusal to admit uh, that the risk was one in a hundred that led to the disaster. Um, and there's a nice bit in Feynman's account where the, the engineers are complaining they could never get a meeting with Mr. Kingsbury. And for me, Mr. Kingsbury is a sort of uh, a symbolic figure, uh, maybe a little bit like Woody Allen Zelig. He's always there somewhere, kind of in the uh, the, the middle of the, the management structure, just quietly changing the, the odds of, of failure in ways that are satisfying bureaucratically, but ultimately disastrous. I looked at the Titanic in a similar kind of spirit. At the time the, the ship went down, everybody hated on the, 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 the uh, chairman of the White Star Line, whose life was more or less destroyed by the disaster. He basically became a recluse uh, in uh, on the coast of Ireland and scarcely spoke. But it, it wasn't his fault that such a large number of passengers drowned. And if you want to know whose fault it was, you have to buy the book. I've, I've learned not to give everything away on these calls, but but it's not what you think, because the Titanic has had a whole series of, of legend-like explanations attached to it, uh, not least in the famous movie. Um, the reality is, once again, one of those little mini middle management mishaps that proved disastrous. And and how do you see this in the context of COVID-19? Do you think that that pattern played itself out in the current crisis as well? I, I, it did, except that this time the, the, the story that it was all the president's fault has really stuck. And you can see why, because Trump made so many errors of judgment and said so many ludicrous things over the course of 2020 that for most liberal journalists, it was just a natural reflex to to blame it on him. And you may remember Jim Fallows writing a piece in The Atlantic saying that essentially the president was like the pilot of an aircraft, and if the aircraft crashed, it was pilot error. I must admit, I, I read this piece, and as I was reading it, I was thinking, no, this is this is wrong. Uh, and the reason it's wrong is that, that being president of the United States is nothing like being a pilot, not not even remotely, because you're you're sitting atop this enormously complex bureaucracy, and and this has been true for decades. When decisions get to the Oval Office, they've already been kind of fought over at uh, multiple levels of the bureaucracy, all the way up to to the cabinet level. So I thought that was a kind of misunderstanding of the nature of presidential power. And then I thought a bit more about it, and I realized that you could apply the Feynman principle. And the way you do it is this. Why exactly did the US suffer very high excess mortality? Why have we got maybe 600,000 deaths that happened prematurely because of the pandemic? And the answers to that, that question go something like this. First, because CDC utterly failed to ramp up testing, in fact, made testing harder than it needed to be. So nobody knew right into April or May who had COVID in the United States. Secondly, there was no attempt to create a contact tracing app of the sort that they used in places like South Korea and more recently Taiwan. That, that wasn't even seriously attempted by the big tech companies. Thirdly, there was a total failure to protect the vulnerable, particularly in elderly care homes. And that, again, happened at the state level. Uh, that, was, that was really a failure of state governments. And, and finally, there was no effective enforcement of quarantines at any point. 
so that people who were potentially infected just basically were able to do what they liked. So all the things that really explain the excess mortality don't seem to me to be uh, attributable to presidential decisions. This is not to exonerate Trump or, or defend him. He made, as I said, numerous errors of judgment. It's just that I don't think his errors of judgment were responsible for a really significant percentage of the the death toll. The truth is what happened in the US last year, and it was true in the UK, and it was true in multiple Western countries, including countries without populist leaders, was a terrible failure of the public health bureaucracy, which had on paper a pandemic preparedness plan uh, of numerous plans in the case of the US. It's just that none of those plans worked. If we tell ourselves that it was all the president's fault and getting a new president has solved the problem, and I've heard this argument made, then the next disaster, whatever form it takes, will, will probably expose a similar failure in the bureaucracy in a different part of the government. So this is a really important argument. It's not a popular one because nobody wants to feel as if they're uh, letting Trump off the hook. But in reality, if we just say to ourselves, if only Joe Biden had been president a year earlier, it would have been fine, then we really are deluding ourselves. By the way, this kind of argument was recently made in the UK by Dominic Cummings, the former advisor to Boris Johnson, whose critique in a long Twitter thread and then in his testimony to parliamentary committee was basically this, that the entire system had failed, not just the elected politicians, not specifically the prime minister, but the civil service had failed and the public health experts had failed. And I think the same story is in fact true in the United States. And we should realize that. Um, you, you note in the book that politicians in democratic societies are structurally disincentivized from dealing with tail risks, unlikely tail risks anyway, long-term problems. Um, can you explain a bit why you, you see that as the case? And what's the alternative if we can't trust uh, political leaders or, or society leaders to prepare us adequately for disaster? What's, what's the alternative if there is any? Well, I think there are two problems that democracies face. One is what Henry Kissinger called the problem of conjecture, which is that if you are, as a leader, confronted with a possibility of a disaster, and uh, you're told that by taking early but costly action, you can preempt it and avoid it, or alternatively do nothing, and you might get away with it because it might not happen, there's not certain to happen. It's very tempting to go for option two and kick the can down the road. Why? Because the, the costs of option one uh, are not likely to get you rewarded politically. People don't really vote for leaders who've averted disasters. There's no gratitude for a disaster that didn't happen. And this is, I think, a fundamental problem of incentives in, in democracy. Uh, we, we never really discuss why there wasn't another 9-11. Uh, but it's actually a really interesting question, why there were no subsequent large-scale terrorist attacks in the United States, and it's been 20 years. Uh, and, and nobody certainly gets any credit for that, uh, even if we know why it happened. So I think that's part of the reason. The other part of the reason is that in nearly all democracies, a large and complex bureaucratic state has evolved, particularly in the last 50 years, much larger than was the case 100 years ago. And these bureaucracies have their own pathologies. They're very good uh, at the uh, CYA approach to disaster uh, preparedness. That's the cover your ass approach, where they produce preparedness plans that run for pages and pages, usually with an accompanying PowerPoint deck. And it looks as if the problem has been addressed. And I think this is very clear in the case of, of COVID. There, there were numerous pandemic preparedness plans from multiple agencies. There was even an assistant secretary for preparedness. And there's this great 2019 survey that the Economist Intelligence Unit publishes in concert with Johns Hopkins saying that the US is the best prepared country in the world for a pandemic with the UK in second place. Uh, and of course, these preparations turned out to be pretty much worthless when a, an actual pandemic happened. So that's the other thing. Now, what can we do about this? I think the wrong answer to that question is we need to heed every Cassandra who has a prophecy of doom. One of the key points about this book is you can't predict the big disasters. 
They just don't lie in that realm where you can say with confidence, there's going to be a pandemic in 2020. You, you can't really get much beyond there's going to be a pandemic. They can't, that, that there's going to be a big earthquake in California one day. But anybody who tells you with great confidence that they know when it's going to be is probably a snake oil uh, salesperson. So I think the wrong approach is to say we need to heed every Cassandra and be prepared for every contingency. That's the kind of thing that bureaucracies find appealing. But but in truth, you could waste an unreasonable uh, amount of resources preparing for everything from the astero asteroid hitting the planet uh, to the zombie apocalypse. So the right approach, and this is the answer to your question, is to emphasize rapid reaction. Because the countries that got this right, or at least did best, Taiwan, South Korea, to some extent Israel, the countries that got this right acted very quickly, and we were slow. And I think what we need to emphasize is not powers of prophecy, but rapidity of reaction. I was very impressed when I was in Taiwan at the beginning of 2020 by the fact that they were sort of ready for all kinds of problems from China, including election interference at that time as they were running an election. But they were quick on the draw when the, there was this story about a new disease in Wuhan that mysteriously, according to the Chinese authorities, wasn't being transmitted from human to human. They kind of just didn't believe that and acted very swiftly to make sure that they could limit the spread of the virus uh, within Taiwan. So I, I think that's the key. And our bureaucracies are very slow in responding uh, because that's really the way they've they've evolved. Great at the preparedness plan, very bad at executing it. I think that's fixable, but not if we learn the wrong lessons from 2020, which I think we're in the process of doing. Uh, you know, the vaccination effort uh, shows, though, that I think free economies um, have certain advantages. You know, you know, the US and the UK were really at the forefront of developing the most effective vaccines. And, and it was thriving and in innovative private industries with government help in this case that, that uh, may have provided us our exit strategy from the, you know, from the pandemic. Yeah, uh, if you're going to get one thing right in a if you're going to get one thing right in a pandemic, get vaccination right. And as I was writing the book, remember, books aren't like newspapers. So it really was kind of finished in August and proofs were finalized in, in I guess, October. It was before the phase three results came out from Pfizer and Moderna. But my hunch then was, and it proved to be right, that the Western vaccines would be a lot better than the Chinese vaccines. And the Chinese promises to save the world with their vaccines, I regarded with great, and it turned out, a justified skepticism. The Moderna and Pfizer results were even better than I'd expected. Uh, but they do illustrate the importance of not having a highly centralized approach to problems of public health. And the fact that there is still a very competitive biotech industry explains why mRNA vaccines exist. Uh, and those people who kind of look longingly at China in mid-2020 say, oh, if only we could be like them, I think really misunderstood the nature of the crisis, which after all had originated in China for a pretty good reason. Um, one of your most interesting chapters is on social networks, and you've written a, a previous book on this, um, that the structure of social and biological networks, you know, affect, affects transition patterns in everything from ideas to viruses. Um, I, you know, I think social media was, was really instrumental in getting international protests going over racial uh, or at least perceived racial injustice in America. Uh, while COVID-19 containment efforts, you know, involved massive interventions to disrupt the networks, the social networks that conveyed the virus. I, I wonder if there's a way to think about um, network science and networks to minimize the risks of either informational pandemics or biological pandemics. Well, it's a key question. My last book, The Square and the Tower, was about the kind of monsters that we've created that now dominate our, our public sphere. And these are network platforms uh, whose uh, business model, uh, that's to sell ads, necessitates getting people's eyeballs on screens for as long as possible. And that, that actually leads to algorithms that prioritize fake fake news and extreme views and, and conspiracy theories. Now, this was something that I was deeply concerned about really from from 2016, 2017, when I, I wrote that book. And I think our failure to address that problem 
left us very vulnerable to the infodemic that has ultimately made it very difficult for the US to to defeat COVID-19. I mean, if if there is a significant holdout of 25% or so of the population who just won't get vaccinated, it's not clear to me that the US can get to herd immunity because these new variants like the Delta variant coming your way, uh, it's already widespread in the, U- in the UK, uh, will get these people. And that's because it's just way more contagious than the original so-called misnamed wild variant. So that that's, I think, a really important part of our, our story, that, that we've got a much, much worse information ecosystem than the Eisenhower administration had to contend with back in 1957 when a similar sized pandemic struck. I think the lesson for me, and it's an important lesson, uh, not only about information networks, but also about networks of travel and transportation, which are crucial in a in a pandemic, is that one needs circuit breakers to be in place. Given that contagion produces these very disastrous outcomes in the biological or medical world, we need much better circuit breakers than we seem to have. Uh, there should have been a much earlier suspension of travel from Wuhan than happened. Uh, it was insane that flights were still leaving uh, direct flights to New York and San Francisco and major European capitals right down until January the 23rd. And that was uh, during the Chinese Lunar New Year holiday when enormous numbers of people were leaving uh, Wuhan. So I, I think the obvious uh, step that we need to take is to think much more about how we can have rapid circuit breakers so that the network can temporarily uh, uh, be uh, disrupted. The interesting thing about COVID is the super spreader feature that that has a low dispersion factor. 80% of the spreading is done by about 20% of the infected people. And, and if you could stop those super spreaders from doing their, their work in the early phase of the pandemic, then you had a pretty good shot at containment. So that's one obvious takeaway. The second and more tricky thing is what to do about the network platforms. I mean, they now clearly dominate the public sphere and they haven't really reformed themselves in any, in my view, meaningful way since since 2016. And there are lots of bad answers to this question, like, oh, let's have an antitrust campaign against them, which is the Biden administration's option. This isn't going to fix anything. I mean, it's a complete, in my view, cul-de-sac to, to try and solve these problems with antitrust. Another wrong answer is let's just have a really powerful federal regulator that can, can squeeze the big tech companies harder. That again is highly unlikely to work on the basis of, of historical experience. So I I argue for a kind of double a combination punch that just increases the liability of the companies. I mean, you have to do something about Section 230 so that they don't simply plead uh, immunity every time anybody tries to sue them from a harm arising from content on the platform. And you need some kind of First Amendment right so that people can't be censored arbitrarily on political grounds. I think if both of those things had been in place, uh, the internet would have done a lot less harm than it did in 2020. Uh, Some questions are coming in from viewers. Uh, Here's an interesting one Um, from Tim Kay. He he asks, are there further examples of institutions in the private sector that do have proper preparedness plans and can governments learn from them? So does does the private sector do a better job of of, uh, preparing for catastrophe or disaster than the government does? Well, it's hard to know how good private sector preparedness plans are. Um, if one goes back to a different kind of disaster, the financial crisis, what's striking about that is that on paper, there were all kinds of preparedness plans uh, in the sense that banks were supposed to be quite well regulated entities and there were federal agencies that had supervision of the mortgage market. And yet the system blew up. And when it did blow up, there had to be frantic improvisation. The Fed certainly didn't have a depression preparedness plan. Ben Bernanke improvised that. And you can trace it in the FOMC transcripts. Uh, Over a period of weeks, Bernanke was able to persuade his colleagues that this could be 1929. And they had to really throw everything at the problem. So I think one can see in the financial world a kind of absence of preparedness on the eve of of 2008. Everybody basically underestimated what the consequences of Lehman's failure would be. Uh, 
I sort of scouted around at the time of the pandemic uh, to see who was doing it right and uh, talked to Audrey Tang, uh, the Taiwanese digital minister, and said, well, you know, how did you do so much better? And and her answer was that you need to have a plan, but you need to have uh, a kind of uh, practice. Uh, you need to have run some simulations. You need to have a sense of how it will work. And I think what's wrong with a lot of planning in Western democracies is that we have the plan, but you don't really try it out. And this is very true for California and the earthquake. I'm sure there's an earthquake preparedness plan that covers many pages somewhere in Sacramento. But in four and a half years of living in California, I haven't been involved in a single drill, uh, not, uh, not at home, not at work. So my sense is that the problem is not the lack of planning, it's the lack of practice. And here the military is interesting because the military has a longer tradition of, of planning. Uh, it also has a longer tradition of skepticism about planning because everybody knows from reading Clausewitz that the plan disintegrates on contact with the enemy and then you're heavily reliant on your, on your drilling and how well trained you are. So I think the problem is actually this lack of drilling. Uh, Audrey Tang emphasized to me not only this sense that the plan existed and it had been tried, it had been practiced, but also that they have very, I think, intelligently used technology to increase the transparency of decision making and make government more responsive to citizens. You'll remember that we had a mask shortage. Most people, in fact, had a shortage of protective equipment at the beginning of the pandemic. So we lied about it and told people, oh, you don't need masks, only the medical professionals need masks, a lie that then came back to haunt the public health officials when they had to tell the truth that masks actually helped. In Taiwan, they were honest about it. They said, look, we have a shortage. Can, let, let's try to, to, to allocate the, the masks appropriately. So I think this use of technology is what we have to copy. They, they've understood, I think, quite well there that you can use internet platforms to increase the accountability of government to citizens and get information to flow rapidly in a crisis so that decision makers are not flying blind or relying on, on models with, with made up numbers. Uh, here's another question from a viewer, uh, Herb Stupp. He asks, as technology advances, uh, do you foresee more intentional disasters from bad international actors, whether China or Iran, the kind of ransomware attacks we're starting to see from cyber criminals uh, more regularly? Uh, will we ever be able to force the perpetrators of these acts to pay for their actions in any kind of effective way? That's a great question, Herb. At the end of The Square and the Tower, the last book, I argued that we were kind of on the eve of a 30 years war in cyberspace, and it would have the same characteristics of warfare in Europe before the Peace of Westphalia. There would be no rules. There would be no respect of national borders. It would be a free-for-all. And I think that's the reality of, of cyber warfare today. It is a permanent state of, of war of all against all. Uh, and, and that's quite alarming because... You can imagine an escalation uh, of cyber warfare. Suppose there's a crisis over Taiwan and uh, it gets really, uh, it gets kinetic, as pe people like to say. That's the moment at which the US can expect a really massive coordinated cyber attack. And uh, if a few crooks can you know, temporarily disrupt the fuel supply on the East Coast. I think the Chinese and Russian governments together could probably do quite a lot more than that. So this is a big disaster that, that could strike much sooner than the disasters that we're supposed to spend our time thinking about, namely climate change. In truth, a massive all-out cyber attack could happen next year. Uh, it could happen anytime. And I'm not sure how well prepared we are for that. The other problem you raise is, is important, that there is no deterrence in cyberspace. Uh, we, we like to say or claim that we can deter uh, the Russians, and Joe Biden's been doing that this week, but it's a lie because we can't. And the truth is that there are lots of criminal organizations that are probably in some relationship to Moscow that will carry on uh, with their malware and other attacks and the Russians will simply say nothing to do with us, uh, and it'll be hard for us to prove that it is anything to do with them. Most of the people trained in strategic thinking during the Cold War are addicted to deterrence. That, that's what you do if you've spent your time thinking about nuclear strategy. But the bad news is there's no deterrence in cyberspace, 
and it's not even clear if you can identify your attacker, certainly not in a hurry. That's that that's really important, I think, because the next war will be much more of a cyber war than most of us are ready for. Uh, and I worry a little bit that that when we come under this attack, if it's successful and disables significant parts of our infrastructure, if we can't any longer have Zoom calls, no, more seriously, if 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 there are fundamental breakdowns in internet enabled forms of uh, of infrastructure management i think the country will be paralyzed and i'm not convinced i have no reason to believe that we have a good plan for that uh, and we certainly haven't trained for it because i don't know a single organization and correct me if i'm wrong i don't know of a single major organization that has a contingency plan for a full outage where you will no longer be able to communicate via email or or, or cell phones what do you do then I don't think of any. I don't know any organization that's thought that through. Um, this relates to that question in a way. You you reject in the book this uh, growing perception. I think that the COVID nineteen crisis has uh, set the United States on a path to permanent decline or relative to China. Um, you know, in, in your view, how has the the uh, pandemic affected the global order? Is the U.S. a little better positioned for post-pandemic strength than you know a lot of people recognize? Yeah, when I was writing the book, there were a lot of articles uh, saying the Asian century is donned; it's all over for the United States. Here comes China, etc. And I, I instinctively rebel against this line of argument. So what the book says is: look, it may look as if uh, China's done brilliantly and the U.S. has done abysmally. Uh, but let's take a closer look. A, this thing originated in China. It doesn't look like it's a pretty story. Otherwise, why would they be covering up what happened so assiduously? It's done major reputational damage to China, not just the origins of the pandemic, but the way they used their so-called wolf warrior diplomacy to try to bend the narrative. I mean, that really went down badly in Europe. And if you look at the Pew surveys, attitudes towards China and towards Xi Jinping became much more negative last year, pretty much everywhere, certainly in all developed countries. Um, secondly, in the financial crisis that the pandemic caused, it was the U.S. that led. It's the Fed that's clearly the dominant entity and the U.S. Treasury that, that are the dominant entities uh, in global finance. And by using massive, perhaps excessive fiscal and monetary methods, they succeeded in offsetting the economic shock and propelling the United States to a very rapid recovery. Uh, this year, China, meanwhile, although it didn't have such a serious uh, shock to its system last year, is still uh, in many ways struggling to get uh, consumption to recover. It's well below trend right now. And so they've had to fall back on the old methods of debt financed fixed asset investment, uh, methods that ultimately will run out of road. I think China's on a significant and sustainable and sustained rather decline uh, in its growth rate. And of course, that's partly demographic in nature. Uh, the third point is that the vaccine race was won by these Western uh, uh, and principally American companies. So uh, Chinese vaccines have been a huge disappointment. Countries that relied on them have not been able to bring the pandemic under control. Chile is a good example, but there are others. Vaccinated really large proportions of people, the vaccines have low efficacy and there are variants that they don't really deal with at all well. So when I was writing the book, which was, as I said, in August last year, my hunch was that the US would look a lot better by the time the book came out, and China would look a lot worse. And I think that's proved to be true. The last point I'd add is just that it's Cold War too. I mean, we may not want to face that, but as far as the Chinese are concerned, it is Cold War too. And in this Cold War, I think uh, the US uh, has uh, significant advantages, uh, though not so significant that it's guaranteed to win. And I think the what the pandemic did was to make it a bit clearer to people that it's Cold War II. Maybe not entirely to convince them. Most intellectuals who write about these things don't like the Cold War analogy. But I'm a firm believer in it because it seems to me that it, it ticks nearly all the boxes uh, that you would want to see ticked if you were looking for another, another Cold War. Uh, and that's where the book ends because, of course, if, if you get to a full-blown Cold War, uh, you've always got the scenario that it turns hot which the Cold War did 
in its early stages in, in 1950 with the invasion of South Korea. That would be in our time equivalent. The equivalent in our time would be the Chinese invasion of Taiwan next year, which would certainly have the potential to produce a very big war, which would be another disaster for my next uh, updated edition. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, but yes, it's it's certainly a, a plausible scenario. Um, you know, one of the political effects of the pandemic, and I think this is true of, of disasters generally, they, they have um, the consequence of making previously radical ideas all of a sudden mainstream. And I think we've seen this um, in uh, the COVID-19 crisis with, with both, um, you know, economics and social policy, where there's been a big shift in what's acceptable. I, I wonder if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, as I said in the book, it's extraordinary how ideas that were marginal or fringe ideas at the beginning of, of 2020, like universal basic income or modern monetary theory, suddenly seem mainstream by the time uh, the CARES Act was passed and, uh, and, and the Fed was uh, buying a vast new uh, issuance of, of treasury bonds to finance sending checks to people's, uh, to people's uh, mailboxes. I mean, e extraordinary things can happen very rapidly. Uh, in a crisis, and and of course, then they become uh, permanent features. This is uh, one of the the laws of of history, first identified by a German uh, economist Adolf Wagner, that if the state acquires uh, responsibilities uh, in a crisis, it it will tend to hang on to them even after the crisis is over. And we saw that. The world wars led to a significant increase in the scale of government in pretty much every competent country. COVID-19 looks like it's doing something very similar indeed. And certainly the Biden administration has seized the opportunity to argue that this proves the need for government to be bigger. Therefore, there's going to be an additional, what, up to six trillion dollars of, of spending in the form of multiple legislative plans. Uh, there's no question that, that these plans would not have been viable politically had it not been for COVID, A, because Donald Trump would probably have been re-elected, and, and B, because without this emergency, they would still have seemed like like fringe ideas. Uh, th this is a related question from somebody watching, uh, Vic H. Uh, he says the uh, World Economic Forum founder, Klaus Schwab, said that the pandemic represented an opportunity to reset the world. Is there historical precedent Vic asks uh, for elites to use disasters to reorder society according to their ideological preferences. Certainly, a good example that uh, that I cite in Doom is that in England after the Black Death, uh, there was a really quite significant effort to expand royal uh, authority and and impose greater controls on the on the laboring peasant population. Uh, controls that that uh, sought to limit their mobility, which was quite important in the aftermath of the Black Death, which killed a huge proportion of of the population. Remember, vastly more than than COVID. I mean, if COVID kills zero point zero five percent of the world's population, that, that will make it uh, just barely a top twenty pandemic. It will bring it nowhere close to the Black Death, which may have killed a third of humanity and certainly killed between a third and a half of the population of most European countries. So there was a shortage of labor in the wake of, of the Black Death that was actually quite a major problem. And the response of the English state was to increase its control over people's mobility as well as to uh, impose a whole bunch of new taxes. The good news is that ultimately this produced uh, later in the 14th century a peasant's revolt. And it was a kind of a case of overreach where I think the English state had, had simply extended its power so far that it alienated a critical mass of, of the population. But yeah, I mean, I think disasters typically seem like opportunities to, to reorder things, often on the basis of erroneous claims about what has caused the disaster. And that's the danger here, that uh, I hear siren voices saying, this happened because the government wasn't big enough, therefore we must make government bigger. Whereas in reality, uh, the public health bureaucracy has never been bigger uh, than it than it was in, in late 2019. Um, if, if we draw the wrong inferences, uh, as I, I'm sure Klaus Schwab is, 
uh, in danger of, of doing. Uh, after all, the World Economic Forum has a terrific track record of, of drawing erroneous inferences, uh, as well as of missing disasters. I can't resist pointing out that in January 2020, I was at the World Economic Forum, uh, presided over by Klaus Schwab. The, do the agenda was entirely dominated by climate change. All the top risks in the global risk report were climate related. And I ran around the conference hall trying to explain to people that a pandemic has actually already begun and that it was slightly troubling that there were four or so delegates from Wuhan at the conference, at least according to the participants' list. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the World Economic Forum is bound to come to some wrong conclusion about this uh, before reverting to having discussions about climate change. Uh, well, a striking uh, argument you make in the book or, or observation is that the reaction to the pandemic of the late 50s in the United States was nothing like the reaction to COVID-19, that the, the life basically just went on as if uh, nothing was really going on. Uh, there wasn't the kind of lockdowns and disruptions we've seen in 2020. I wonder what's, what's the difference? Because as you, as you note, that pandemic of the late 50s was very similar in terms of uh, its, its health consequences to, to COVID-19. I think COVID will turn out to be worse uh, because it's not over and it's killing significant numbers of people still. So I would guess that in terms of its share of the world's population that it kills, COVID will end up being bigger, but not much bigger, not not as big, anywhere close to as big as 1918-19. So I still think the 57-58 Asian flu is about the best point of comparison we have. And remember, that pandemic killed young people as well as old people. I mean, this is a very ageist disease, COVID. Uh, they'd have been very happy to have had COVID in the 1950s because in 57, you were dealing with excess mortality amongst teenagers as well as the very young. We haven't really had to deal with that. And that is a huge, huge difference, which we perhaps underestimate. It also matters actuarially because if you're killing young people, the number of life years lost is is really a lot larger than if your if your disease is just killing people over over sixty or over sixty five or seventy. So I think it's worth comparing the two uh, diseases, and I do in the book, and it's one of the parts of the book I really enjoyed writing because I just felt as if I was reading about a different country. The approach of the Eisenhower administration was unbelievably minimalist. They they spent almost no additional federal funds, and they spent the money only on facilitating uh, the production of a vaccine. That was it. Uh, there were no closures. There was no declaration of emergency. Uh, schools stayed open. People continued to work. Yes, there were sp spikes of mortality, two pretty big waves uh, of mortality, rather, as we've seen in the last 18 months. And life went on. Economically, you can't detect the pandemic in the data. It's really hard to see it. There was a slight recession in 57, but it had nothing to do with the pandemic and actually had started before it. So I, I came away with two answers to the question of why the difference. And one answer is a cultural one. I mean, the generation that had fought World War II and Eisenhower was president had a different attitude to the possibility of excess mortality. They, they also had a different attitude to, to a crisis. And the speed with which the Eisenhower administration reaches its decisions and then follows through is really impressive. They got a vaccine within a matter of months from development to getting it into people's arms. Uh, so there's partly that. And I think ordinary people just were tougher, uh, not so risk averse. People were willing to accept that there was a risk of infectious disease and that was life. The other thing that I came to realize as I was writing the book was that they just didn't have the options that we had. I mean, you just couldn't tell everybody in 57 work from home. You couldn't. I mean, many people didn't even have a telephone line. So it was a different, very different world. And when you go back and, and read about 57, 58, you see that the, the, the nature of the country has, has changed perhaps more profoundly than, than we realize in, in the intervening time. Uh the, the, the book argues that you know, COVID-19 is going to have a lot of long-term effects on our societies, but that the death of cities like New York and London is not going to be one of those consequences. Uh, you do sit, say, though, and this is, this is uh, quite interesting, big cities will become cheaper, grungier, and younger. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that, um, you know, which is a question, of course, of great interest to the Manhattan Institute. 
Well, the good news for the Manhattan Institute is that I think this will be much more of a problem for San Francisco, a city so so badly managed that this uh, almost has felt like the death knell. New York and London are, are different. As the book shows, they've withstood multiple disasters over their history, including many uh, worse uh, epidemics than than this one. And London, of course, survived uh, heavy bombardment by the Luftwaffe in the form of the Blitz. So I think the general proposition that I that I would advance is that it's quite hard to kill a big financial centre. Uh, Although it can happen, and Venice is the example of a financial center that died and became an ossified uh, uh, tourist destination. I mean, you could imagine that perhaps happening to New York, but I don't think COVID is going to do it. And the reason that I, I think that is that there's just an enormous uh, uh, elasticity uh, with a place like New York or London. If something happens that causes, let's say, a bunch of the uh, wealthier uh, older citizens to leave, uh, whether for fear of their health or more likely uh, because they feel the city's no longer a great place to be, the taxes are going up, better to be in in uh, in uh, Palm Beach, then that just creates opportunities for younger people who previously couldn't afford to live in Manhattan to, to move in. So younger, uh, grungier for sure. I mean, you can sense the, the crime problem as one of the lasting legacies of the protest wave of, of last summer in multiple American cities. Uh, but, you know, you and I are old enough, uh, Brian, to remember when New York was a pretty grungy, uh, young and quite dangerous uh, city. Uh, it goes through these cycles, uh, uh, as does London. Uh, and maybe it got a bit too uh, glitzy and, and, and high end uh, for its own own good pre pre pandemic. I mean, a, a plague that really kills the elderly much more than everybody else. In a previous era, let's go back a hundred years. Ask yourself how people like us would have reacted to such a disease if it had struck in 1920. Well, the social Darwinists would have been celebrating uh, that a disease could be so discerning as to take away people who either were very elderly or had significant comorbidities. Uh, and they would have uh, seen this as a great opportunity to rejuvenate society. That's not how we think today, uh, because our culture is radically altered. But in truth, there, there will be some of that, though it must be said not as much as if the disease had been much more lethal than it has been. Your concluding chapter suggests, and this is a point you make throughout the book, that predicting the exact next, next disaster isn't a science. We, we can't really do it in that sense. But that science fiction and dystopian literature uh, you know, can offer us a way to imagine different kind of scenarios. Uh, can they serve as warnings? And you know, are there particular works that you find relevant to our current moment? I was thinking to myself, Back in 2019, I've, I've read a lot of history in my life, but I really haven't read enough science fiction. And the reason I was thinking that was that trying to apply history to contemporary problems will, will get you a long way, and, and certainly more people should do it. But history is quite bad at helping you think about technological discontinuities and what they might mean. Whereas science fiction is this great uh, effort by a good many imaginative people to, to do that for you. So I spent the pre-pandemic year furiously reading uh, science fiction writers in an attempt to think about those sorts of discontinuity that as a reader of history I might, I might miss. And uh, a couple of writers really uh, helped me think better about uh, the problems that we confront. Uh, the Chinese author Liu Cixin, uh, whose three-body problems some people listening will certainly have read, is, I think, one of the most extraordinary writers living today. And I devoured his uh, work available in, in translation, including the two uh, sequels, uh, The Dark Forest uh, and, and Death's End, amazing books, not least because they give you a great insight into how a, a highly intelligent contemporary Chinese thinks about the world and the future. So those are must-read books, and I love them, and I quote them extensively towards the end of, of Doom. The other writer I got very into was uh, Neil Stevenson, whose book Snow Crash, written in the 90s, seems to have envisaged a great deal 
about the world as it is today, particularly a world in which everybody is sort of half the time online and their avatars are having a slightly better time than they are. That's certainly the world of a lot of young people uh, over the past 18 months. Uh, young people have been under kind of house arrest uh, because of a disease that doesn't particularly threaten them. And they've been leading a life, on a social life online that I struggle a bit to, to fathom. But, but Stevenson foresaw all this in, in Snow Crash. And I think Snow Crash is a rather brilliant uh, visualization of what a world could be like if, if the online experience started to be better than, than the real thing. Here's a question from uh, a viewer, uh, M. Bernstein. How replicable is the success of South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and New Zealand in dealing with COVID? Two of these are small states with bad neighbors, two are islands, and all tend to be more homogeneous and trusting than most Western countries uh, across a number of dimensions. That's a great and, and legitimate question, and I don't want to give the impression that the United States can be Taiwan uh, or South Korea, uh, for that matter, New Zealand. I think, though, that we, we forget a couple of disadvantages that Taiwan and South Korea had. They were very near uh, to where the disaster began uh, compared with us. Effective distance really matters in a networked world. And we really effectively were much closer to Wuhan than we realized, given the, the fact of direct flights. Uh, and therefore, we should have been thinking a bit more like the Taiwanese about the Chinese threat, because it was much closer to us than we really wanted to, to face. Uh, the second point I'd make is that just because you're a really big country doesn't mean or shouldn't mean that you can't do things like testing. I mean, there, there really is no excuse for the utter failure of CDC to get testing uh, to be done well. That wasn't something where a small country had an advantage. We should have been really good at that. We have any amount of capacity uh, throughout the economy to generate rapid and efficient tests. And it was flunked partly because CDC wanted to centralize the production of tests, which was an idiotic decision when you think about it for even a few a few seconds. Uh, the same goes for contact tracing. Do we have some disadvantage there? Hang on a minute. We have the biggest technology companies in the world. They could graph our social networks at Facebook in five seconds with great precision. The fact that we took no advantage of the technology companies' vast reservoirs of, of data and processing power, I think, is a really odd thing. And one might well ask, why, with all the data that they have, are those companies not doing more in the public interest than they seemed willing to do last year? I think, I think scale isn't relevant here. You can do this kind of thing regardless of your scale, provided you have uh, an effective government and a willing private sector, which I think... Uh, we seem to lack. Finally, the issue of homogeneity and trust is a really interesting one because I don't know that it's as powerful a, a distinguishing feature as people tend to assume when they draw cultural contrasts between, oh, I don't know, Confucian East Asian societies and, and libertarian Anglosphere societies. I mean, th those kinds of arguments look less plausible to me when you realize that not only New Zealand, but also Australia proved perfectly able to do the kind of things that they were doing in South Korea and Taiwan. And I don't think Australians are that different from uh, British and American people when it comes to uh, trust uh, and homogeneity. Uh, so I, I think we give ourselves an excuse. And it's a kind of weird excuse when we say, oh, we couldn't do those things like contact tracing uh, because we're such liberty-loving individualists. And yet we were willing to submit to effectively mass house arrest in the form of strict lockdowns. I, don't, I just don't understand how lockdowns were a triumph for the Anglo-American spirit of freedom and a contact tracing app would have been a terrible violation of those, of those ideals. Well, uh, Neil, I think we're nearing the end of our broadcast time today. I wanted to thank you very much for uh, joining us at the Manhattan Institute and for an excellent discussion. Uh, and I want to thank all of the viewers uh, who watched uh, Neil Ferguson's book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, is out now. Uh, it's available for purchase at the link uh, in the comments window on your screen.
and you can get it uh, and in all bookstores and on Amazon, of course. If you'd like to hear about uh, more conversation like today's uh, or interested in supporting the Manhattan Institute or City Journal, you can subscribe to MI's newsletters, City Journal itself, of course, or consider making a donation. So there are links for doing so also in the comments window on your screen. So thanks again, Neil, uh, and uh, really appreciate your time today. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Brian.